Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, on a rainy day like this, right? We're gonna have to go easy. So, we're gonna speak about love changes perception. Um, we hear this from time to time in our news. It's becoming more out in the news. We go to internet sites, we read magazines, and we see documentaries on television, and it's kind of becoming something popular. But then we hear this all the time. Yeah, okay, if you love, you, you see things in a different way. You can change your life by changing your attitudes. But what's behind it? Do we have enough support to believe something like that? Because I can hear that if I don't believe, if I don't have enough support that satisfies myself. You just go in this way, go out that way, and we don't hear anything, we don't learn anything. What we want to do today is try to understand what the evidence is and make it a fact of science. It is a fact of science, so that's what we're going to bring into uh, the study today so we can believe this once and for all and start loving because that changes my perception. When we, um, when we studied the human body, okay, when, you started, when we started studying the human body, we started many, many, many years ago at the biology, uh, biology level. So we go cell by cell and organs and stuff like that. There's a point where they kind of hit the wall and say, but there's something more. And that something more came up a little bit later. That's where psychology and the study of the mind comes in place. And then they go in and they study that and they kind of hit the wall again. And there's something else. And that something else is still not clear for a lot of people. For us and all these spiritualists, uh, we call the spirit, which is above everything. But not everybody has reached that top. When you study from the bottom up, you'll have limitations. So we don't get to that point up there that easily because it comes from the physical plane. It comes from the material realm. You're studying cells and organs and stuff like that. And it's very hard to s jump up to the next level. Now. The, science, the materialistic science studies that way. They go up. But us and the spiritualists, us being part of it, of course, we study from the top down. That's a different approach. That's totally different. So for us, when we talk about something physical in the body, our understanding of it is different than theirs because it's a consequence of something that is high above. For them, it's, it's a different approach. Now, when we blend both what they on that side show us and us on this side know, the result is just beautiful. And that's how we accomplish the idea of uh, uh, supporting the evidence that love changes perception. And that's what we're going to do today here then. Uh, we go back to uh, Alan Kardec and we know that we are a physical body, but that's not really what we are. We, we are a spirit with a physical body. And in between, there's something that is called the perispirit that makes the transitions. These are different energetic levels. So the perispirit is this connection between spirit and the body, body being matter. Now we can see this matter, the physical body uh, only, only the physical body in several different ways. There are several different angles that we can study this body. One of them is this. So this body is composed of 65% water and other things like proteins and fats. And when you go like, well, 65% 60 water, so anything that impacts water in, cer in a certain way will impact my body, my physical body, in a certain way. One of the most interesting experiences related to this is the, the Japanese scientist, Mr. Emoto, which was studying crystals, water crystals, by doing different, uh, uh, putting different levels of vibration. So they would pray around gra glasses of water. They would say bad words around glasses of water. And when he goes deep into the microscope to study these molecules, the crystallization of these molecules, they were completely different. So the ones that were under the influence of, or strong vibrations of love, fraternity, anything in that matter, would display in the microscope a totally different structure compared to the molecules subject to negative vibrations. So the same happens here. Negative vibrations will make these 
uh, we are water, 65%. It's gonna make our water, our watery part, be carrying this negative energy. And the other way around, good vibrations and good environments will make it better. This is one way of seeing this thing. Of course, we have proteins and fat that matter, but most of it is water. Now, there's another way to view this physical body, which is using the vocabulary that comes from biology. We are, compo we are an organism. That's what they call the body is an organism composed of several systems. Nervous system, respiratory system, digestive system, okay? Each system is composed of organs. So for example, digestive system, liver, intestines, stomach, and so and so and so. These organs are composed of tissues, which are the elements that will m m create these liver, stomach, and so and so and so. Tissues are made of cells. So we're getting really into, uh, you know, narrowing down to the microscope level. Cells are composed of proteins. This is all science. This is not spiritism. This is plain biology. Proteins are composed of amino acids. And then you look at this and say, wow, so how do, how do I, where does love fit in this picture here? At what level does it fit? Does it fit from, let's say, organs up or maybe cells down? Where is love? Okay, in order for us to understand this, we're gonna go to the deepest level. The deepest level is the amino acids. So we're gonna study here the three basic levels, cells made of proteins, which are in turn made of amino acids. We are going to study these things deep down to see how love plugs in. And, and it's just very interesting, very beautiful. Again, we're gonna study cells, proteins, and amino acids. Cells, okay, cells are composed in, in terms of academic, for, for purpose of studying and understand, we divide the cell in three parts. One is called the nucleus, which is this, in this picture here, this little pink part here, in the middle, in the center of the cell. Cytoplasm, cytoplasm is everything else, that's not the nucleus. And the main brain, which uh, uh, attaches the, a boundary to the cell. Each one of these three parts has a specific function, a specific uh, uh, tasks. So we are gonna study those because that's how we are gonna see how love jumps into the cell, okay? So we're gonna start with the cytoplasm. Again, cytoplasm is everything that is in the part of the cell that's not the nucleus. When we look into the cytoplasm, which is this entire blue part here, there's a lot of little things in there. These little things are called organelles. Uh, we have several different types of organelles and the purpose of these things is to make the cell, to give the cell full functionality. A cell, one cell, uh, works as a full body. It has digestion, ingestion, respiration, everything, everything. It's a full body in a tiny, tiny, tiny little thing. But it has the ability to do this. In order to do this, the same way we, we need, you know, a digestive system, a nervous system to do all these functions, the cell has the same thing. It's just that they are tiny, tiny, tiny. And what the, this is what these organelles are doing there. They are making the cell live as, as a, at the physical level, okay? So these, uh, the, so there's metabolism in here, there's respiration, there's breathing, there's different things. Now, one of, these, uh, one of these little organelles here, which is probably for us spiritists, the most important one because Spirit Andre Luis talks a lot about this particular one, it's called mitochondria. Mitochondria is responsible for metabolism inside the cell. What is metabolism? It receives something and converts to energy. That's what it does. Each cell in our bodies has several uh, mitochondria. Some of the cells have 400 mitochondria. Some others have a little less. The cells where metabolism are more intense, and these are liver and uh, the pulmonary system, they have up to 400 mitochondria per cell. Other cells don't have that much, that many but they all do have mitochondria inside. And the mitochondria in each cell is responsible for the metabolism. So it's a key function in each cell. Now, what we discovered uh, 
much later than the discovery of the DNA structure. The DNA structure was discovered in 1953 here in New York City. Much later, about 25 years later, we discovered that not all the DNA was what we thought. There is DNA that's not in the nucleus of the cell. Some of the DNA is in these mitochondria. And we didn't know that at the time. When we got to know this, then we could explain a lot of other things. For example, the uh, Dolly, the sheep that we know we was cloned. And in principle, uh, oh, well, yeah, we were able to do this. this so these sheep shouldn't have a just normal life, just like everybody else or any other animal expected. And it didn't. It died very young. It, the, metab the metabolic functions didn't work as expected. Now we know why. Because when you clone cells in general, what you do is you take the nucleus out of the cell, put another nucleus, which is the one you're trying to clone, and develop that. But the problem is that cell, when you take the nucleus out, the mitochondria are still the same, the original. When you put another nucleus, they don't talk together. They don't get along. And the metabolic rate is set up by the DNA in the mitochondria. That's why the sheep couldn't didn't have a, 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 the right metabolic rate, and he actually died very young. But that's another story. We didn't know that at that time. So time goes by, technology helps us find new things, new discoveries, and, and we just didn't know that at that time. So when we, look at, when we look at the nucleus, we thought the nucleus was the brain of the cell. That's in 1953 when we discovered how the DNA structure works. Well, that was a beautiful discovery, but it wasn't everything. What we knew, what we discovered is that this nucleus is composed of chromosomes, which are 20, uh, 23 pairs, total of 46, coming from half the mother, half the father, and this is gonna have my DNA. What is a DNA? We need to understand what DNA is, especially us, spiritists, because if it's not clear, we make a lot of wrong interpretations. This chromosome, as you see here in the picture, okay, it's like a, a, a helix, but it's all twisted. It's twisted. When you untwist, you get something like this. It's like two tapes. If you take two tapes and you twist them, that's what it is. When you untwist, then you got two flat tapes like this. If you're able to lay these two flat tapes on a table and look at them, we would see that these tapes have parts. They are divided in parts, but the parts are not all the same size. So one part is this much, the next part is this much, then the next part is this much, then the next one is this much. They are different parts, different things. Each one of these parts is called a gene. These genes are responsible for other things, uh, uh, physical characteristics and other things as behavior. So for example, one of these genes, one of these little parts has to do with the color of my hair. The other has to do with the color of my skin. The other has to do with the structure of my bones and so and so and so. And then we knew about that at a certain point. But we, what we didn't know is that in 1966 or 67, when we started cloning cells, we goes back that far. It goes that far back in 1966 or 67. We thought, we thought that by taking the nucleus out of the cell, the cell would die. Because supposedly, for all purposes at the time, the nucleus was the brain of the cell. So if you take my brain out, I'm going to die. So they assumed at the time that when we take the brain, the, the nucleus out of the cell, uh, we got to put the new one almost instantaneously because this guy's going to die. Well, in 1966, 67, we start doing cloning. We take the nucleus out of the cell and nothing happens. Nothing happens. In fact, not only the cell didn't die, but its behavior didn't change without the nucleus. And then we go like, there's something wrong. It's not that the cell is wrong. I am wrong. I'm not following the process. I didn't quite understand how this thing works. So I need to go deeper and study this thing a little bit more. And that's why we, this, we had to go in a little further and understand how the nucleus works. Today we know it's a different story. We're going to talk about this a little bit. But what are these, these genes? What are they doing there? Okay. What they do is they are what we can call 
the recipe book. The recipe book. You gotta think like this. A cell is composed of proteins. Okay, so let's just uh, do some analogy here. Let's say that this room is a cell that we are. Each one of us is a protein. Each one of us has a particular function within this cell, okay? So for example, let's say that uh, at a certain point, we need to um, bring in some adrenaline. So we have to receive adrenaline that's coming into the cell. Well, there's gotta be one of us responsible for that. You know, like it would be our warehouse manager, if you will, is gonna go to the receiving point. Yeah, give me that, it's mine. You see, this guy has to receive. When, he, when this guy is not in the cell, because this is, this is very dynamic, proteins are born and they die, they are born again, they die. When the receiving of the adrenaline is at, uh, when adrenaline is at the point of being received, and the guy is not there, he has to be created. That, that prote protein has to be created. And the only way to create is, where is my formula? How can I create? I need to go to a place, to my manual of instructions that's gonna tell me how to build that thing. That manual of instructions is my recipe book. That is my DNA. So the only thing that the DNA does is a recipe book. Now think about this. If you have a recipe book in your house and you open on page 10 and it's chocolate cake, if you leave that page open on your table, will you have chocolate cake in the oven? Fodder. No. The book doesn't do anything. It needs an intelligent principle that reads that, goes through the instructions, and takes the action, physical action, to make it happen. The fact that you have that in a, in, in a recipe book doesn't do anything. So genes don't do anything. Genes are a lookup table. How do I do this? Well, let's go to the manual. Genes are our manual. The, so uh, the DNA code, our gen genetic code, is the recipe book. Each recipe is one gene. So there's a recipe to create uh, for the color of my hair, another one for the color of my skin, and that goes on. Each one of these genes is just a lookup table. They don't do anything. They don't take any actions. They don't have any ability to do anything more than just that. And these genes, all of these are made by proteins. Then we go, but, yeah, but what is these proteins, right? Because it, it could be different things. What is protein? Well, proteins are chains of amino acids. That's what biology tells us. And we go like, that's too complicated. I'm not getting it. Yeah, it is too complicated. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to demonstrate using some toys here, some gadgets, to see if we can understand that better. Because when we understand the, the functionality of the process for us, spiritists, it's a lot easier. So what I'm going we have a total of 22 amino acids that our body creates. And you can see here, that it's a chain of amino acids that creates a protein. So they, they, they go together like this, okay? So for example, I have here several amino acids. One, two, three, four, I have more here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna assemble a protein. Okay, we're gonna simulate that we are assembling a protein. So here it is, here we go. So I'm gonna go like this. Okay, then we can go, whoops. We can go like this, for example. This is a protein made of amino acids. I'm gonna do another protein. You can have several combinations, several different, different possibilities. So here's another protein. And we're gonna use this one to discuss. Okay, so this is another protein. And we can do several combinations, several different, in the order will matter because it's gonna give us a different shape, okay? Now, what is important is each one of these things, each amino acid has electrical charge. So that changes everything because we know that to bind two charges together, they have to be opposites. So if this guy here is positive, and it's gonna bind to this, this has to be negative, otherwise they don't bind. So let's say, for example, that we assembled these five amino acids and we got to this. Now, let's say that this guy in blue here is positive, and this guy in blue here is also positive. These are the two ends of this protein. If they are two positives, 
what is most the more likely structure, this or this? Number one or number two? Number one, because these guys tend to be apart. They are the same charge. Okay, so now I got positive and positive, and here comes another amino acid, and it plugs in. What happens when it plugs in? This guy's negative. It has to be negative, otherwise it wouldn't bind. When it's negative, now we got negative and positive. So the most likely structure is no longer this, it's this. Is it clear? Because this is positive, I'm gonna try, it's gonna attract to the opposite. So this thing keeps like this all the time, depending on what happens here. Every time something plugs here, it goes like this. It goes on and off and on and off. This very dynamic movement of parts called amino acids, it's what biology calls life. For them, life is this. This is life. Proteins moving. For us, life is a different thing, but we need to go by their standards so we can understand what they tell us and how we plug these two things together. So these amino acids here, okay, will make proteins movable. They will move and they will change shapes and, and, and they will do whatever is needed to keep it all happening. Now, one interesting thing is when you look at the main brain, and here's a, a representation of the main brain. This is the main brain. And the main brain has a lot of these things here. But they are not inside the cell. They are half out and half in. You see here, this is the main brain. There's a lot of antennas, if you will. So part, part of this thing is outside and part is inside. Now look, think about this. From this point down is inside the cell. From this point up is outside the cell. If I am inside the cell, I don't know what's going on outside. I can't see. I don't know. But when this happens, okay, when something plugs in here, what happens down here? It goes like this, right? So I'm in the cell. I don't know what's happening, but I can tell you, well, something happened because this thing moved. And the cell knows what this guy is there for, what this protein is doing there. Here's an, a, an easy example. Say, for example, again, that this room is a cell. Each one of us is a protein. I am protein Luis Lima. My responsibility within the cell is uh, when it rains outside, I have to sh close all the windows so we don't get flooded. That's the only thing I'm doing here. So here I am, and there's gonna be a sign for me. The sign in the cell is something's gonna move. So let's say that there's a red light here. When the red light goes on, that means to me it's raining outside. So I'm supposed to go around, close all the windows so we don't get flooded, okay? So here I am, everything is nice and easy, and suddenly that goes on. So here I am, here I go, I shut all the windows, and the cell goes living. Each one of you has a similar purpose. Now what happens when this goes red and protein Louis Lima is not in the cell? Because this is a dynamic process. Sometimes the protein is there, sometimes it's not. So when I'm not there and this goes on, what happens? We're gonna flood, so the cell is gonna die, all right? It can't happen because it, there's gotta be a mechanism of protection. There's got to be a backup, a plan B for this thing. There is a plan B. The plan B is there is a supervisor, somebody that's assigned as a supervisor in the cell that keeps looking to this thing. It's red, okay? So the supervisor is going to say, where is Luis Lima? And when he, does, when he finds Luis Lima, he's okay with that because Luis Lima is going to take care of it. When he doesn't find, he has to take action. Otherwise, the cell floods and we're gonna die. The room floods and we're gonna die. So he has to take the action. He has to build a protein called Luis Lima. How is he gonna build that? He has to go to the recipe book. Where's the recipe book? It's a genes. So he goes into the DNA code, opens the page that says, how to construct protein Luis Lima. Oh, here's what I do. I take this amino acid and this and this and this and here's protein Luis Lima. Now protein Luis Lima has been created in the cell and it's gonna take care of the problem. This is how it works. This is pure biology. That has nothing to do with spiritism yet. This is how it works. 
And so this thing here, this antenna, if you will, that sits across the membrane becomes the most important thing ever in the cell. You see, the DNA is not important. We can live without the nucleus. Cells live without it, but cells don't live without this. These are the signs of what's happening out there and what I have to do inside to compensate, to eat, to breathe, whatever happens here. I will know because this is moving. There's gonna be another protein like this sitting right next to it and that's gonna move and that's a different function. This means, for example, uh, we got melat melatonin in, that's coming in. We got adrenaline that's coming in. We got insulin that's coming in. Each one of them has its own function. That's how the cell works. So the membrane on the cell becomes the most important thing ever because it has these receptors. One receptor for a different thing, as you see here in the picture. These little antennas, these little upper parts of proteins, each one does one different thing. You see how complicated this is, right? It was just easier not to know anything about it, right? No, that's not how it works in spiritism. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. Okay, so let me, let me tell you this. This thing here that plugs in and changes the format, this thing is called, technically it has a name, it's called stimulus. So how is this thing happening? The stimulus comes in, this is gonna move, right? When it moves, it's because the receptors felt, you know, the, the connection, they receive this and the protein moves. Now, there's gonna be a question here, which is, is the matching protein, like I said, is protein Luis Lima responsible to do something when this moves? Is he in the cell? If he is in the cell, we're all safe, okay? The response is gonna be around, that Luis Lima is gonna go around and close all the windows and we're, we're all set, we're all happy. Now, what happens when protein Luis Lima is not there? The supervisor, the supervisor has a technical name, it's called regulatory uh, protein. This regulatory protein, the supervisor, is going to have to do something. So he's going to say, somebody goes to the, pro uh, to the recipe book, finds how to do, to create a protein Luis Lima, okay, access the code, the recipe book, accesses the DNA, copies the recipe book page. You see, when you go to your recipe book and you want to do chocolate cake, you don't take it out. You read it, but the page stays in. You don't throw it out. So we don't, we don't take out the, that DNA part out of it. The DNA stays, we copy that. So we copy that DNA and then we build protein, whoever, Louise Lim in this case, and then the response is gonna happen. This is how it works. It, it, it is complex, yeah, and it's not even as simple as this. This is the level that we spiritists need to understand you know, the message today. Now, when everything works, it's beautiful. Now, here's the problem. This protein here, okay, is supposed to have a certain one function in the cell. That's what we thought. Now, here comes a stimulus, okay? This goes in, and something takes place within the cell because of this. Now, what we found out is the same stimulus comes in. This goes like this and the action inside the cell is different. And we go like, it can't be. Why not? It's the same stimulus, it's the same cell moving, it's the same protein moving, but what happens here is different. You see, if there's more than one behavior for the same one stimulus, there's gotta be something that gives a command. Well, do this, but now do that. This commander cannot be in the same physical level that the cells are. It can't make that decision. It has to be at least one level above it, at least. It has to be somebody that's overseeing the process and says, okay, this stimulus do this. Oh, you got the same stimulus, but this time you're gonna do that. So the regulatory protein is not really all that great. It's not that really that manager that we thought it was. It has its limited power, but there's something else above it. And that something else above it, we started studying that with the cloning. In 1966 and 67, a new science was born. Instead of genetics, we called epigenetics. Epi means above, like 
your derm, epiderm, above, epi is above. So the epigenetics that we study today is studies what controls the genes. We already know by now, it's a fact of science, that genes don't control anything. Genes are blunt. They are a recipe, a static recipe book. That's all it is. When you write a page, for example, uh, when you write your, your recipe in there, and it says, two, say, two cups of sugar, there's never going to be a day that you open on that page and it says three cups of sugar. It's not going to happen. For that to happen, there's need for an intelligent principle to go in, look and say, two cups of sugar is not enough. I need three. The intelligent principle is going to overwrite the recipe. But it needs to be above the physical level. The page and the ink on the page can do that. It needs to be at one level, at least one level above the book. It's the same thing here. So when we started studying epigenetics, we, we, we understood why certain things didn't make any sense from the regular genetic study point of view. We would expect that when I do this, I'm going to get that. At times I would, but I would do this and I would get something else with no explanation whatsoever. And now we know why, because we need to study at least one, one level higher. But we're still not at the spirit level, not yet. It's, it's, it's just one level above. So why did we get into this situation where we thought that the DNA was the nucleus, uh, uh, the DNA in the nucleus was the brain of the cell? What went wrong? Because it's not. We know it's not today, but what went wrong? What went wrong is this. When James Watson and Francis Crick who discovered the structure of the DNA in 1953 here in New York, they are looking at a cell full of proteins and everything moving. You can understand the complexity of looking into a microscope and everything is flying, and you're trying to find the DNA in it. When they found the DNA, the, electric, uh, the, the uh, structure of the DNA, the, way to, the best way to find this is what we do in our lives, is this. Well, this protein is not it. This is not it. This is not it. This is not it. Oh, I found it. That's what we do, right? You want to find a needle in the hay? That's what we do. This is not, this is not, oh, I found it. So we kind of threw out those proteins that were not the DNA. When we got to the DNA, we found only 50% of the answer because the other 50% of the answer is on the proteins that we threw out. We never went back to analyze what they were doing. Of course they had a purpose, but we didn't care because at the materialistic level, that didn't matter. What mattered is I found it. I found the structure of the DNA. I'm captive, held captive of my genes, and I'm going to live by that. And that wasn't true because we didn't pay attention to the other half. So obviously all proteins have functions in the cell. Every amino acid is doing something in there. It's not a biological accident. It is a lot more than this. So these, out of 50% of the proteins that we didn't know what they were doing, these were the ones controlling the DNA. When we found out, we said, well, now I've got to study these because I haven't paid attention to any of these guys yet. When we went to study this, that's when we got to epigenetics. They respond differently to the same uh, stimulus. So you see, the control protein responds different, not the actual protein. It's like, for example, the top boss in a company comes to the manager and tells him, I need this done. And every time he asks for that, the manager will tell his employees, do this. But there's going to be a point where the manager receives an order from the director, the same order, and he decides to take a different action. So the guys in the office will act differently because they were instructed by the manager that was responding to a higher uh, uh, order. It is exactly the same thing here. When we went to study the control of the DNA, we started finding that there's a lot more. And that a lot more was in the books uh, Evolution into Worlds, uh, Dynamics of Mediumship, uh, what else? The two or three books that uh, Andre Luis had written in the 40s, 1940s. They were all in there. 
And then science is kind of catching up. And for us, it's just beautiful because we're blending the two things together. We know both. So classic genetics only goes from the DNA level down. The DNA gets copied and generates a protein. Epigenetics goes above. It finds what the stimulus is, what the reactions within the cell are, and then how the process takes place. You see, this here requires an intelligent principle. This cannot be done by plain material cells. It requires an intelligent principle that plugs into the cell somehow. So here are some interesting facts about this epigenetics, all right? 95% of the cancers cases do not have anything to do with genetics. It is perception. You see, what we found out is this. Here's a stimulus. The way I perceive this is what makes this go one way or another here inside the cell. Here's an easy example. If a person is a heavy drinker and you give him a glass of whiskey, is that a good or a bad thing for him? It's good. Because that's what he likes. That's what he wants. He's going to thank you very much. I love this thing. For somebody that doesn't drink and doesn't want to see alcohol, is that a good or a bad thing? Bad. But it's the same stimulus. Okay? I can ask you, for example, uh, I can be here in a red shirt. Tomorrow morning, I don't want to be in a red shirt. It's the same person. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to have a different perception about myself, about my own clothing. If I ask you, what is the best color for this wall? I'm going to have 200 answers. Because somebody's going to say black, somebody's going to say blue, somebody's going to say, well, just white. Because for different people, the perception is different. The stimulus is the same, ink, or the stimulus is the wall, or the stimulus is a shirt. The result is different because the perception of each person is different. Each one perceives things in a different way. And here's something very interesting that it kind of doesn't make sense to us spiritists in a way. You all know what placebo effect is, right? You, you take a patient uh, who is, for example, here's an example, who is about to die and he's not reacting to medicine. And you just tell him, well, I got good news for you. The doctor will come in and say, I got good news for you. We just discovered last word, just came out of the oven. This is a new pill that reverts what you're having. It was never tested on any human. You're going to be the first. Do you want to try? Oh, yeah, I want to try it. And you just give him sugar. And he, he reverts everything. And those are facts of sciences. These are not, you know, this is not anything that we're making up. These are documented facts of science. Now, at the same time, the same science tells me they don't believe that the mind controls the body. Isn't that kind of, where's the coherence, right? They tell me that placebo effect is a documented fact. At the same time, they tell me that the mind doesn't command the body. The perception doesn't change anything on the body. How come? If the patient had the perception, he heard the doctor and he had the perception that that pill, oh yeah, this thing is going to cure me. There's no medicine in the pill, it's just sugar. And it cures. So... Obviously, the placebo effect is the most lively proof that we have that the mind commands the body. Not only that, perception commands the body. It, w w f uh, when I present you with a pill, for me, I can, oh, that's a pill. For that person, he's going to say, this is the latest discovery of the science. This kills everything that I had. You see, it's the same pill, but the answers are different because the perceptions are different. So perception becomes something important. It becomes this, this general idea that we live by perception. Now, let's analyze this a little bit. When this comes in, when this stimulus comes in, it is perceived by this cell in a certain way. If the cell perceives this to be a good thing, okay, like we have here, let's say a nutrient, this is going to be positive overall. If it perceives this to be toxin, 
it's going to be negative overall. Think about the uh, uh, drugs, for example, like I said, right? People on drugs, if you give them more drugs, he's in love with that. So it's a positive thing for him. For those who are watching from outside, they go, oh, my God. It's a negative thing for us. So every time we or each cell, this is at the cell level, right? The cell level. Each time the cell perceives something to be good, it goes in growth mode. Otherwise, it goes in protection mode. Here's a simple example. Again, this, is the room, this room is a cell. We are all proteins. Let's say that somebody in, comes in the door with a gun shooting, shooting up like that. What would we do? We would run away from the door, the furthest as we can. Maybe this corner here, everybody at the same time. You see, in that moment, I'm in survival mode. I'm just trying to survive because there's somebody out there threatening my life, threatening my life. If I am in survival mode, mode, automatically I'm not in growth mode because I can't. I can only grow if I'm not, if I don't feel threatened by anything. If I'm not in survival mode, they are mutually exclusive. It's either or. Because of the perception, so it depends on what this means, okay? So we are at the cell level yet. When this is perceived to be a good thing, it causes what we call approach. So let's say that the guys with the gun there, what we're going to do is we're going to run. We don't want to be there. We don't want to be close to the door. We're going to run. We as proteins all run to, to far. Now, if somebody yells from the door, there's free chocolate cake. Come get it. Come and get it. We're all going to approach. That's how the proteins are inside the cell. So they will, and here's the cell antenna again, the receptor, they will approach or run. That's all they do all the time, depending on what this means to me. This might mean a certain thing, the same stimulus might mean a certain thing for me during 10 years of my life. And then I change my perception about this thing and it becomes something else. All right? So the meaning of this thing can change because my perception can change. Now, this is at the cell level. Now, we are 70 trillion cells. So when we see this as a body now, not as one cell, as a body at the body level, if you, are, if you see something as generally good, you feel attracted to it. When you feel something that's generally bad, you don't want to see it. You want to get away. You want to stay away from it. When something attracts you, or you, when you feel, we have the perception that something is good and you feel attracted by it, that will boost your immune system. That's the growth mode over here. When you feel that the stimulus is not good, it debilitates the immune system because you're in survival mode. It is so that uh, people who do uh, transplants, uh, at the body level, at the physical level, the first thing that should happen is, we don't want you here. New liver, no, we don't want you here. This is not the liver that was in the body before. There's gonna be a repulsion. We don't want you here. So the doctor has to give you medicine enough so the body doesn't react and doesn't try to reject that new organ. What they do is they give you heavy, heavy, heavy stress hormones. So you are so stressed, so stressed, so stressed, right? That your immune system is debilitated, it can't react. You will not complain about that liver that's living there now, and you will generally accept it. That's how they do transplant, post-transplant surgeries. That's how the organ stays in, if you will. And what we know today is that of all the things that can cause attraction, approach, growth, and all things like this. The one that comes in number one is called love. And the thing that makes us go down, number one, is fear. See, it's interesting because we usually say love and hate. Love and hate. At the biology level, at the protein level, it's not. Fear is what destroys the body. So fear of being nice, fear of being good, fear of doing the nice things, fear of 
loving, fear of doing charity. You see, these are all good words, but still fear. So you're still on this side. I should do charity to this guy here on the street. Yeah, but I'm afraid he's going to... You see? You're on the afraid side. You're not in the should I do charity side. No, there's no charity here. There's fear. And we fear a lot of things. We fear a lot of things. We are... That's what we have to train ourselves for, to stop having fear and doing more changes, be more aggressive in terms of doing this moral transformation. We are afraid of doing moral transformation. If we are afraid, I'm not in growth mode. I can't change. I can't grow. It all depends on us. It, this is still all uh, free will. We all have our reasons, but regardless. It's all, it all has to do with perception. So things changed with time. Things changed. We thought that the stimulus, okay, the stimulus, remember, this thing here, would generate a response, but not really, not anymore. The stimulus will pass through a filter. That filter is the perception. What does this thing mean to me? It's something good, here's the response. It's something bad, it's another response. So the filter matters. And where is this filter? Who is this filter? It is the environment where the cell is. Now, think about this. One cell, another cell, another cell, another cell. They are in an environment. What is this environment? Andrea Luis tells us what it is. It's created by the mind. The mind creates the environment. This is very well explained by Andrea Luis. The mind creates the environment. So the environment changes my perception. So my, what is my environment? Well, today um, I really want to kill somebody. <laughs> That's my environment. My, all my 70 trillion cells are perceiving anything and everything that comes in as bad and I want to kill you. Now, I'm in great Love mode, I mean charity mode, because I've done charity the whole day today. Oh, I'm beautiful today. Anything and everything that comes in is regarded as charity and good. You see, what makes the event take a, a certain response is not the event. It's how I see it. It's how I perceive it. And again, coming back, the one that makes everything different is love, because that's the highest love. So the environment outside the cell, which is created by the mind, is what sets the responses within the cell to this. If I'm in revenge mode, no matter what plugs in here, it doesn't matter. This is always bad. It just doesn't matter. If I'm in charity mode, no matter what comes and plugs in here, it's always good. This is how biology responds to our cells. To, to our minds, just how cells re respond to our minds. Some interesting passages within the spiritist literature, evolution in two worlds. Andrea Luis is gonna tell us that each cell is a domesticated infinitesimal animalcle. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on. Okay, animalcle, small animal, infinitesimal, much smaller than what you thought before. Domesticated, what is domesticated? It has an owner. It, has a, it responds to the owner. Who is the owner? The spirit. So when my mind, my spirit, sets the environment as revenge today, this is revenge. Th this could be a nutrient. This could be asparagus. It could be chocolate cake. It's bad. It doesn't matter. Because my perception sets the pace for me to respond that way. It's a preset, I go in preset mode. I respond uh, uh, automatically to these things because I, do, I decided to do so. Here's another passage, also from Andre Luis. Medicine, regular medicine, will come up with a thousand ways to help an unhealthy body regain its balance. Talking about physical body. However, it is up to us, us here, to practice the medicine of the soul, which will set a different environment. When you hear stories about cancer being eradicated from a body, 
10 years later, that will come back in most of the cases, in a lot of cases. What's wrong? If you don't change the environment, you will recreate the whole thing again because this means that. Until the day that I change how I see this thing, I change my perception. Here's another passage. That's very interesting. This is written in, the in 1945. 1945. All organs, organs are physical level. This is biology. It's nothing to do with spirit, nothing to do with mind, organs, okay? Liver, stomach, pancreas, all organs are subject to moral ascendancy. Wow. Moral ascendancy. So the liver responds to my moral. My pancreas responds to my moral accordingly. My stomach responds to my moral accordingly. How is it going to respond? It depends on my perception. It can create Ill, uh, illnesses. It can powerful emotions can heal the body or destroy it. It all depends what this means to me. It doesn't depend on this. It depends on what this means to me. And I can destroy my own body or I can heal my own body. Things can go right or wrong, not because of this, because of what this means to me. Okay. All right, so let's wrap up this whole thing. We know now that our genes and proteins respond to something called epigenetics, in which the environment m matters, the perception matters. They come from perception. Perception comes from the environment, the mindset that I'm living on. And the mindset is set up by my perispirit, which comes from the spirit. So when we go backwards, it makes more sense. If you try to go this way, it's too complicated. But if you go backwards, it makes more sense. You see, my genetics comes from how I perceive the environment, which is a mindset that is in my perispirit. It was set by the spirit. Now, these two parts here on the left are studied by us. Biology does not study that. That is studied by us. These are studied by them. So if you don't put things together, a lot doesn't make sense. A lot of the responses are broken. A lot of the responses won't come out. It is a, a, a study in two worlds, evolution in two worlds. We study that side, they study this side. But when we put it together, that makes it a lot more beautiful. The same scheme here we can see from the moral aspect. That means a more evolved soul will have more elevated thoughts. More elevated thoughts mean a more refined perispirit. A more refined perispirit means more vital fluid more vitality, better immune system, healthier body. This is what Andre Luis just told us. There is moral ascendancy in the organs of our body. Now, what we do with our body is a different story. What we know is this. Healing depends on love. I can heal if my environment is not love, because this is the mo this is the higher uh, positive environment that I can set my mind on. So if I want to heal, I need to be in love mode, no matter what. When we are in love mode, we forget that we are sick because our cells don't respond to sickness anymore. It just doesn't exist. It's all a matter of perception. Thank you very much. You all have a great night.